Hey ho, I'm Alaric Hall. I work at the University of Leeds in the School of English here. Um, and I was presented with this sea of possible topics for, um, you know, for podcasts. Um, and from this sea, I picked this one, um, Beyond A.C. Bradley and F.R. Leavis, The Critics and How to Handle Them. So that's just been kind of thrown out there by one or another A-level examiner. And uh, I kind of thought it was an interesting one to, to have a go at. Um, and I'm actually more kind of anxious or trepidatious um, about this particular podcast than I'm about any of the others because um, I'm conscious I might basically give you a load of advice that works for me here at university and for what I'm trying to get my students to do, but actually may not uh, really sit very well with what your teachers want you to do at A-level. So you're going to have to take a kind of critical view of what I'm saying uh, to kind of relate what I'm saying to what you've been told in class and stuff. Um, and maybe to talk to your teachers or, or you know, whoever's kind of guiding you through your A-levels um, about um, how useful this advice is for what you're doing. Because the kind of advice I'm giving you is the kind of advice that um, I would be giving to my undergraduates here at the University of Leeds. And what I'm trying to get my undergraduates to do here at Leeds is to write and think um, like professional scholars. Um, and so, in a way, what I'm asking you to do is to start thinking like people like me, um, who professionally write academic research. Um, and in a way, that's a tall order. It won't always fit with what you're expected to do at A-level. But hopefully you'll find it useful, and, and it'll all kind of come together. Um, so yeah, this, this question is phrased. It says, beyond A.C. Bradley, beyond F.R. Leavis. I don't know if you've heard of A.C. Bradley or F.R. Leavis. If you're in a class, might try and do a show of hands, don't know. Um, I, I've heard of Leavis. I haven't read anything by him. I once asked one of his students to go and read something by him, and, and they said it was useful, so that's great. Um, never heard of A.C. Bradley. Don't know, so I have no idea quite where, you know, where, where this guy's coming from. Um, I suspect he's coming from about the 1950s. Um, and, and the way I'm going to try and help you to think about dealing with kind of scholars is a kind of 21st century way that, that I'm used to. But it's amazing how like, different academics will get inf inflamed with rage um, on the subject of how you should go about kind of relating to scholarship and stuff. So you will get other different opinions as well. Uh, other people will have different views from me. So rather than thinking about the critics, as if there's a kind of, I don't know, football team or a, a band or something, the critics, um, I find it more useful to think about um, what I would refer to as primary literature, secondary literature. And some of you will be totally familiar with those terms. I don't want to patronise you, but some of my students get to University of Leeds and they've never heard these terms, so I'll spell it out. Um, from the point of view of an English literature A-level, your primary literature it are the poems and plays and novels that you're actually being asked to write about. Get an essay question like, discuss the significance of money in Emma. Emma is your primary text. Um, secondary literature, secondary texts, are texts that have been written by scholars or you know, other commentators, people like me, maybe one day people like yourself, um, about that material. So they'll give you ideas for what you can do with it. Um, and primary and secondary literature interrelate in quite different ways in different subjects. You might be doing um, an English language A-level, for example, where you'll think much more about data rather than primary literature, data rather than um, uh, novels and that kind of thing. Um, but for an English literature degree or, say, a history degree, one of the kind of really important and striking things about that kind of study um, is you can go back and check the primary text really easily. If some critic uh, says something about Hamlet, you can go get a copy of Hamlet and actually kind of check. So the, the kind of fundamental um, evidence in our field always comes from the primary literature. You can always go back to that and play off what other people are saying against the primary literature. That's the most important thing. Um, so I just wanted to get this terminology um, floating. What we'll be mostly talking about today, of course, is how to use secondary literature. Um, when I was doing A-level, um, we had, I mean, when I did A-level English anyway, we didn't look at secondary literature at all. Um, I, I don't think I read like a single work of secondary literature. Um, I did a bit for history and stuff, um, and I'm pretty sure that that's changed or is changing. And the reason why it's changing is just the whole economy um, of, of the world is changing. Um, 50 years ago, wealth was about gold, or if you had enough of it, coal or steel. It was about industry. Um, but now, wealth is about intellectual property. Ideas are the most expensive thing and the most valuable thing there is in the world. And how we work at university and how you work at school is changing to catch up with that. But the system is kind of creaking 
as we try to kind of help you move from a world where um, A-level English is about knowing stuff to a world where A-level English is about finding stuff out. A world where you're moving from um, learning to researching or kind of repeating stuff to arguing stuff. And we want to help you argue and find out and research. Um, and to do that, we need to kind of relate to this secondary literature. Um, and what I see a lot of um, when I teach at Leeds are kind of habits which I assume people must be picking up at A-level. Um, maybe you're not. I don't mean to patronise you or offend you or your teachers, for that matter. Um, but the, um, the kinds of things I, I tend to see coming through are that students have got the kind of surface idea of um, how to use secondary literature, but they've never really thought about the fundamentals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those surface characteristics. Then I'll think about, well, what is it that we're really trying to do with secondary literature? What, why, why do academics cite it and use it? Get some of the fundamental reasons in position. And then move on to giving you some advice about you know, how to kind of actually apply that when you're writing essays and stuff. So some of these surface manifestations that I tend to see coming up are things like um, students will say to me, I need X things, certain number of things in my bibliography. Um, someone will have told them, there we go, someone will have told them at some point in their studies, okay, you've got to have you know, five things in the bibliography, that's the rule. There's no kind of rule like that for me at the University of Leeds, I never set a rule like that. Um, but there's a kind of surface idea that you have to have a bibliography of a certain size. Um, another thing that I get coming through a lot uh, would be... Ooh, let me just uh, have a look at my list. Oh, yeah, OK. Another thing that I get coming through a lot is the idea that you should um, quote... Oops. Secondary. Lit to support your points. Um, students quite often will make a point in a sentence of their own, then dump in a quotation from someone else that kind of supports that point in their, in their view. So you've got this idea, you've always got to quote someone to support that idea. Again, it's not something that I would really want my students to do. You do have to be citing your material, we'll come on to that in more detail, but actually just quoting chunks of other people's words, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't usually get you very far. Um, but that's another kind of theme that I see coming through a lot. And the other thing that I see coming through a lot, the kind of surface manifestation with referencing, is just the idea of, oops, plagiarism. There we go. Um, and my students kind of live in this kind of legalistic fear that they'll get done for plagiarism because they've kind of accidentally stolen an idea from someone. Obviously, I don't want my students to cheat. I don't actually want my students to steal ideas from other people or not recognise that they're, that they're using them. But the reason why we have referencing is not just for some legalistic purpose. There are actually kind of useful, important things that it does do. So I'd like to kind of try and give you a sense of those. 